No, funnily enough, it was um, the first time I actually heard Castonia was um, back in 2007 when I joined K-Scope because um, when I went up to the offices, they was, they gave me they let me steal a load of CDs, so I went through all the Peaceville stuff and um, took all the Castonia. And I, I remember putting it on and just liking it so much that I emailed Jonas back in 2007 and said, oh, "I love you," because his voice is just so distinctive and so beautiful. So I I let him know that, and it, but it was just really I never knew that four or five years later he'd be singing in my studio so uh, no I, the first time I met Jonas was um, when he came over so it was uh, it was quite we were both quite anxious because we'd never met each other um, but luckily we got on really well the, the project actually started about three or four years ago you know it, there's, it, it, it was a, the seed of the, the songs came from um, a uh, guy called Johnny Wilkes at, who works at K-Scope because um, we were talking about studios and, and recording and all that kind of stuff and he sort of said oh I've got some ideas that I've been messing around with and I said yeah okay, give them to me and then, so I took them these they were really sort of basic structures and the li you know little melodies here and there and um, and so I just took them and produced them you know it's totally different to the pineapple thief just just so you know lots of beats lots of synths and um, and it just sort of grew. And it was only recently that um, that we were able to get Jonas, you know, because he's so busy with Castonia, so we were we were able to get him over and uh, and sing. But it was always he was always the number one choice because it's it, the the music's perfect for his voice. Did you did you had any specific intentional changes introduced into your in the way that you create the songs, or what were the, the differences when when he came and and started be, start being a part of it? Funny, no, we didn't have to change it at all. Um, we, we had some guide vocals, um, Jonas heard them, and when he came over he just put his spin on it. And he's so chilled out, it's unbelievable. He was just uh, sort of sat down, two, three takes, and he nailed it. You know, it was, uh, he just, it was, it almost seemed like it was just one of those happy coincidences that just everything sort of came together really well for, for, for the record. I think the main, the, the, uh, the, the main thing about the album is that it's 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 dark, you know, uh, musically and lyrically. It's um, it's quite bleak, although um, although there's still it's still about love and people and separation and desperation, all the all the stuff that inspires people to write, really. But um, I, I guess that's one of the main differences between, even though the Pineapple Thief is pretty dark. The wisdom of crowds is like pretty, you know, it's the, it's it's even darker. So I, th I guess that's the main aesthetic for the record. I think you, it's, it's it's a good point because in the as I've developed as a songwriter, it used to start it used to be riffs, you know, and and uh, and the music would come, and then almost the lyrics and the mel and the melody of the words would be an afterthought. So you, the, the the song would be done, and I'd be thinking. Right, let, let's. It needs some vocals, and because in the early days we used to do quite a few instrumentals, and uh, but now I think now I've sort of developed my songwriting. It's it, the, the two come together, so the vocal melodies and the riffs. Now um, the stuff I'm writing now is very much um, integral. So so it's something that I've developed. Sort of the vocal has now become much more of an instrument for me. I think when I listen back to the early early recordings and uh, listen to my voice, it was it, it, it's I can't listen to it basically. I I always say I'd, I'd sound like a more whiny Billy Corgan, and even you know it, and if you can imagine that, you know I love Billy Corgan, but I didn't. You don't want to sound more whiny and than than him, and then that was me, and it was like, and I don't know what it was. It was practice, gigging, years and years of doing it, and my voice. Then I just started doing things with my voice and. Whereas before, like you say, uh, there would have to be loads of lush or lush arrangements and, for my voice to work. Now, um, it, it, we're getting into really sparse, can get away with really sparse arrangements. So it's certainly something that's, that's developed. And um, I think the stuff I'm writing now is even more, you know, get, in, on occasions it's going down to almost vocal and, you know, maybe one other instrument in, 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 in places. So. It's, yeah, it's something I'm really enjoying and sort of exploring.
the, the vocal side of things. That's true, yeah. I, I think we, I mean, K-Scope are always up for doing limited runs, you know, the first 5,000 are always special bot digi books with a bonus disc and um, they said, can you do a 5.1 surround mix or something? And I said, no, I don't, you know, you always do 5.1, but how many people have really got 5, uh, listened? I know a few people complain that we'd never do 5.1 mixes, but hardly anyone, I don't know anyone with a 5.1 system that they listen to their albums on. And um, so I thought, let's give them something interesting. So we, even, like you say, even though a lot of the, the, the main disc is quite acoustic, Stripping it down to just acoustic guitar and vocal was something really easy, especially because all the songs I write originally with an acoustic guitar. So uh, before before I go to the studio, I get it. I get. I know what I'm doing from strumming and humming with a, with a guitar. So it was just an easy thing to do. Yeah, that's true. You almost yeah. You, you it's almost re rewinding back to where the song began. And I always said that if it doesn't work, if a song doesn't work with a strip back to an acoustic, then there's, you've probably got something wrong with it. Every album that we've done, we've wanted to up the production values, and luckily, because we're selling more records, we've got more money. So for this one, we just realised that we had enough money to, to rent a decent studio. Um, so the first thing we did, we went to a studio called The Chapel, which is in the north of England, and uh, it is an old chapel, um, but really, really high spec. And so we got, so the last album is quite big, it's quite big sounding, the drum sounds quite big, but that's because the drum was in a, in a chapel. And uh, so we, we spent um, a week camped in that studio recording, and then um, the overdubs were done at my, my studio um, in my house, and we went over to Prague to record the string section, so, and then mixed it, it all came together, and I think, I think because we, we focus more on the recording, you know, because it, it, it all begins with, if you've got a good quality recording, then it's easy to mix. Um, and I think that's that's why the new ones, the, each album sort of sonically, I think, is sounding better and better. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, the, the, two of the songs was from the, the same session, um, Innocent and uh, What You Saying, they, they, they we just didn't put them on the album because it was the album didn't need them. Um, not that they would, didn't like the songs, but um, but it was just sometimes just making an album long for the sake of it is not a good thing, I think. And uh, so and we wanted to Casco wanted to release re release it, and we wanted to sort of put a, a close to sort of all the wars era. Um, so I thought trouble is the three three tracks wasn't enough, so um, I recorded the that. Um, the acoustic track, um, which was more like a solo piece for me, and um, S Steve, who's AKA Dirty Hi-Fi, did a did the Build a World remix on, on the end. So it's it's really it's it's quite it's just a sort of fan collectible piece really, the the, the EP. But um, it's I think it just finishes it finishes the All the War session. No, I, I came up with the, the, the whole thing. Do you mean the intro, the way it comes in yeah. with the intro? The, the, no, that was, I don't know where it comes from. I, I was probably just, because quite a lot of the time I jam in my studio and I, you know, I program some drums and just mess around and then pick a guitar up and sometimes it just takes you places. So yeah, it was just, you just don't know where songs come from sometimes. Good. It's it's a tricky one. You know, I, I I think I think to sum it up, I, I I say we're not comfortable being called prog, but I'm happy with being called progressive. I think there's a difference, and I think there's a lot of people out there who were into into their prog with you know where they enjoy lots of solos, long songs, just a completely different style. Um, you know, nothing against it, but if you if you know bands like um, the Flower Kings or Pendragon, um, bands like that, 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 that have got a good following, people they're they're prog they're prog rock bands, and then people see the Pineapple Thief labelled as progressive rock, so they listen to it and they go, well, this is this is terrible. It's not you know because that's what they want. So, but 
the trouble is, is there's loads of people, loads of progressive rock fans who really love us, but there's an awful lot who think that we're we're traitors to the progressive cause. You know, it's, but I, you know, I, I'm not. I grew up listening to 70s progressive rock, um, but then I like loads of other stuff. You know, I like metal. I like I like contemporary rock. I mean, you know, but it's it's so it's I I. I I, we wouldn't be here without the progressive rock scene um, because they're really, really passionate. You know, they come out to gigs. When you're small, you get, you get a crowd um, because it's, the scene is really vibrant. But I think that gradually we're sort of crossing over to other um, audiences as well, you know, the mainstream metal and rock audiences slowly. But that's not to say that we're ashamed of our progressive rock sort of roots. I wouldn't want to say that. I, yeah, I put the um, basic arrangements together, so I programmed some strings, just, but um, what, we were recommended a guy, um, because we found a studio in Prague, we, and the reason we went to Prague is because it was a lot cheaper to do, and um, the, the guy they recommended, um, this guy called Andrew Skeet, um, who is, is quite, you know, he's done a lot of work, and um, luckily he agreed to do it, and um, so I sent him all the tracks, and I just said, look, I've done some guide, but just do what you want. I'm not the expert. I don't know how to, to make a, a string section talk, you know, to, I'm not classically trained at all. So, um, so it was a bit of a gamble, but we all went over to Prague um, and Andrew did the arrangements and they just came, came alive. It was, yeah, we were really lucky. I hope we can work with them again. Well, it never stops for me. It's, uh, I've already written four four tracks, you know, I've written more than that, that four have, have made the grade, um, you know, demos. That, so uh, the, 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 the plan is, these are our last gigs um, of the year, uh, apart from some festivals in the summer. Um, and then, then we're gonna head down and record in the autumn. And according to Casco, we keep, keep on track. The next album will be out in April next year. So we wanna keep, keep things rolling. Well, yeah, I, who knows, um, it's, I, I just don't, I never really think about it. No, I've never, I, I just, even when I did 10 stories, I didn't set out to make a sort of big concept album. It was, uh, so yeah, who knows, who knows what might, might, might come out the other end. Well, you know, I, I grew up listening to the 70s stuff, you know, Led Zeppelin, yes, yeah, Supertramp, Camel. Um, the, when I was really young, I really got into the Alan Parsons project, because there's a, the guitarist that plays with a guy called Ian Benson, and he was really influential to me. You know, he did, he's, he's, he, he wouldn't, you wouldn't know it, but the, his, every guitar solo he does, are really, they're really melodic and uh, really well thought out. That you can sing along to every single one. and. Uh, but then as, as, you know, through the... So I kind of got turned off by music in the 80s, which is why I went back to the 70s. Um, but in the, you know, in the 90s, you know, the grunge era, you know, the Sound Gardens and uh, you know, Nirvana, Rage Against the Machine is probably one of the, the best, best albums ever, ever recorded. And uh, um, more recently, you know, I, I really enjoy the pop rock of Biffy Clyro and the Foo Fighters. You know, that's it's not that I would ever take the pineapple thief down that that um, level of pop rock but it's still still influential and um, one of my favorite albums of all time was uh, the one of Beck's albums it's a uh, one called sea change which is very soft it's very uh, lots of acoustic guitars but that was where I was really influenced by the strings because if you ever listen hear that album the string arrangements are just unbelievable the, the best I've ever heard so. I think the only thing is, is that you, as soon as I do something with a guitar that sounds like a million other things, I just get turned off. So I think um, that's probably why. It may it, hopefully it's very hard to get a distinct guitar, you know, be a distinct guitarist. But um, I think that's that's why it is. Is 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 that sometimes I see bands and you just see guitarists going through the motions, you know, and 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 I'm thinking, well. 
surely they'd be thinking, let's try and do it. Let's try and make do it differently. Let's do it different. Give it a different edge or make it sound slightly differently. But I've not. It's only recently that I've got re a bit geeky about guitars because I, I was talking to John Wesley, who plays with Porcupine Tree Live, and uh, um, and he was he basically taught me all about. He upgraded my rig basically because uh, in something decent. So now I know all about all the different pickups, all the different kinds of necks and guitars and words and amps and wiring systems and all. It's a, you can get totally lost in it. Best, so, yeah, well, the, I've just got a new head, uh, amp head. It's an H and K, um, Hughes and Kepner Triamp Two, which I managed to get a good deal on. But it's the most amazing sound. All valve, but it's got because um, the, the Pineapple sound is. I always tend to. I don't like over-processed sounds, so it's generally just a nice clean, a crunch drive and a metal sound and um, maybe a bit of delay, a bit of octaves going on but um, it's the most gorgeous sounding amp I've, I've had so that's, that's my latest latest toy that I've, I've brought with me and it looks beautiful as well, it sort of glows bright blue yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I knew you were going to ask that um, do you know, I, f I really struggle, and I've struggled for a long time, and maybe it's my age where, you know, all the best albums that really infected you were from, like, years and years gone by, you know, and it's, um, I think, I think the, probably the last good, great album was, probably because it was the, one of the best gigs I've ever been to, was um, by a guy called John Grant. He's, he's not heavy, he's just, he's piano, acoustic guitars, um, just a singer-songwriter, but it was just good songs, good melody, and I think it made me realise, and a lot of people say to me that, oh, they only, only got the Pineapple Thief when they saw us live, and, I, and it was the same with this guy. You, you see them live, you get blown away, and then you go back and play the album, and you hear it in a totally different light. So, yeah. And yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to think about that. Sort of underrated yeah. bands that, that should be selling, you know, should be getting getting out there to more people. I know what you mean. That's a, that's a difficult one. I mean, if you look at um, the latest band that's just joined K-Scope, Amplifier, you know, they they recently were complaining about um, you. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I think so. So drop some beers and waters in the next sort of four or five minutes. Great, that'd be perfect. Yeah, thanks right. a lot. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they were saying we, we're not going to play in the UK anymore because people aren't coming to our gigs. You know, and it's really tough. And I don't know whether it's anything to do with the economy or, or what, but getting getting um, successful on the road is a real real slog. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. No, I can't think. I, I, I'll have to... I'll have to some questions really stump me because I can't think. Apart from us, of course. You know, that uh, it should be doing better. I have to think and drop me an email on that yeah. one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Amplifier, I think, uh, with the octopus. Yeah. They they kind of got some attention there. They did, but, but because they self-released it. Latest, this, yeah. this latest one, I don't think it worked so good. I, I get any impression that it was done quite quickly. And um, I think that the band was running out of money as well. So uh, I think the octopus probably just took a lot of the life out of Cell. You know, it took, he spent so many years make, putting it together. And the fact that he did everything himself, you know, they, they, at the time they were releasing it themselves, they were organising their, their talk, you know, ev everything, you know. And I think even he admits now that there is a place for a record label, you know, to, to help a band. You can't do it all yourself even though they probably made a lot more money. <laughs>